All right. Hey, Josh, how's it going? It's going well. As, uh, well my first... as, any... as well as anything is. I mean, like, it's a weird question to ask people, how's it going in the middle of a pandemic? It's like, how are you? I'm fucking terrible. We're all terrible. Why are you even asking? It's just like, you know. Anyway, what did, you get to... did you get to do anything for Thanksgiving yesterday or was that quiet and chill? Oh, yeah, we did this crazy, like, Zoom thing where, like, everyone, all our family, like, Zoomed in from everywhere, and we all cooked, and no one could tell whose, like, kitchen timers were going off at the right time because it was, like, they were all coming through at the same time. And then I was listening to, like, electronic music in the background everything, so it was just, like, basically, like, a lot of beeping for coming from all different parts of the world. It's not on brand <laughs> for 2020. Across time and space, really, for, for many hours. But, but you know, good times. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to ask, uh, let's introduce you. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Josh, and I'm a prodigious collector of harebrained schemes and half-baked ideas. Uh, let, uh, let, let's, oh, no. rattle off, let's rattle off a few of those things. Uh, you, yeah. You're an author, you've written a few books, you're a yeah. musician. Um, yeah. is, is playwright the right word? Uh, For, yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, so, and playwright is actually spelled with a W. Most people don't know that. Not I, 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 really... I have it. I have it written with a W on my my my. Yeah, paper it's here. considered like crafting, like the way you would like, like being like a shipwright or something like that, which is so fucking pretentious. But that's you know that's what it is. Yeah, you've done some short films, musical director. There's a lot more. I'm sure I don't even know about. We'll get into. Um, yeah, but yeah. I, I'm a, I like to call it a jack off of all trades, masturbator of none. <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I, I do love the range of your career. You've done all these things. And myself as a creative person, I, I know myself and a lot of other creative people, we all have a lot of interest where we don't always get to everything we want to do. I know me, like me, being a musician is the thing I've kind of hunkered my identity into, but there's part of my brain I, that really wants to be a comedy writer or learn how to animate or produce television, do all these other things. So it's cool when I see someone like you who does see, seem to chase after everything that you're interested in. Why is it important for you to pursue all these different outlets? And is, well, is there one that excites you the most? Well, so in a weird way, I don't really think of them as being that different from one another. Like when I sort of like tried to take a step back and go, who am I and what do I do? Um, what it kind of comes down to is that it's all really just different mediums of communication. So I really just consider myself a communicator and different messages need to take different forms. And that's really all it is. It's like to make a really terrible, simplistic example. It's like there's sometimes when you need to make a phone call and sometimes when you need to make a text message. Similarly, there's some things that you need to express in an, uh, a, a novel and some things you need to express in a 1980s power ballad. Like they don't always cleanly fit. Like not every message fits for every medium, but ultimately the core thing is it's just an attempt to try to connect with people. So it's really kind of a question of what, what is the thing I'm saying is the form that it is going to best serve it and uh, tune into that, I guess. But also I just, I'm, you know, as the Joker put it in Batman, I'm a dog chasing cars. I have no plan. I just see something and go, let's try that. And I have this like unbelievable collection of just like half baked, half finished things where it's like this week, I'm going to make a kid's album. And this week I'm going to start an eighties hair metal band. And this week I'm going to write a novella. And this week I'm going to become a slam poet. And it's just, I'm insufferable to be around. That's really the short version of it. It's just crazy schemes. Let's start an emu farm, Mitch, you and me, we're going to do it. It's going to be great. I'm down. Uh, so besides emu farms, are there other form forms of art that, you that are in the back of your head they're like i'd like to try this i haven't done that yet Ooh, that's a good one i don't know i mean this sounds so dumb but i've always wished i could play the piano and i just it's i have no aptitude for it no matter how much i try i, I like i I, I'm, I can do decent synthesizers but that's mostly turning knobs it's not really like working the keys like pianos oh, right. are just a mystery to me and every time i've sat down and like tried to learn it's just it's like my eyes glaze over and I'm, you know, I get like about five bars into Moonlight Sonata and I'm like, I can't do this. It's not for me, but I see yeah. other people do it and I'm like, damn, that's cool. I'm, I'm trying myself that. this year. I, before COVID, I started taking piano lessons and then I, I was surprising myself with how much I was progressing because I had tried to sit down and learn things and given up. Like with string instruments, I find it 
if you play guitar, it's going to transfer over to bass or ukulele or other things pretty well. But piano, there is almost no transferable skills. Maybe some dexterity in my hands, but that's about it. Yeah, it's uh, for me, it's the um, the concept of the black and the white keys versus the fretboard. They're two mm -hmm. entirely different alien concepts, and it's the idea that the you know, the fretboard is the same no matter where you just start from a different point on it, but the intervals are, you know, the spacings, the fingerings remain the same. You can just slide everything like bar chords. And with um, piano, you have to like reorient the shapes based on like when you're going up and down between the black and the white keys. And that just breaks my brain. But I actually yeah. just realized as I was talking, the thing I've always really wanted to do and never been able to be a part of is to play in a taiko group. A Japanese taiko group, which uh, there's not a lot of them, which is probably has a lot to do with it, and it's a weird thing to try to start. But I'm like, I, have you ever seen Japanese taiko music? I was, I don't know exactly what that is. I know a lot of like Japanese '70s it's, progressive. It's kind of things. like a hybrid between like martial arts and drumming. So oh, like, okay. you ever see it? It's, yeah. So it's like anytime you ever see like a like a movie about a karate tournament. There's always a taiko band playing at the climax as they bring out, you know, like the two people that fight at the end. But, but it's just this crazy form of drumming that's like sort of drum opera. But like when you see it, it's really theatrical and it just has this really cool, crazy sound. And it's really, uh, it's just really engaging and kinetic. And I, I just love that. That and uh, like drum corps and marching bands. So those are things I've always wanted to be a part of and never quite had the opportunity to dovetail into. So, is there a it's modern... hard to get a lot of, I mean, it's hard to play drums at all, you know, just because it's so loud. It's really hard to get like 10 drummers in a room. Where do you even find a room that will let you do that and neighbors that will not murder you? So, Right. Is there a modern version of that Japanese taiko thing? And that sounds like it's a more traditional kind of art form there. Are people still practicing that? Yeah, I mean, it's usually if you usually see people doing the more traditional form, but I have on YouTube seen several um, ill-advised attempts to like fuse it with new metal. It's <laughs> right. not good, uh, but <laughs> but like it's it's not broke. Don't fix it. Like you know, it, it works just fine. It's 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 exactly what it is. But I'm sure there there'd be ways to like actually fuse it with like um, you throw in like a couple rolling SP pads and some trigger and cool electronic samples, and you'd have a a pretty banging electronic group. I mean, I saw the Swedish band, the Knife, once, mm. uh, and their whole deal is like they only use um, drum trigger pads, no matter what the sounds are. And the reason why is because when you see it on stage, it's so like kinetic. Every sound has like a motion attached to it, which um, makes it like a much uh, more interesting performance. Like overall, like it's a sort of more cohesive thing and uh, you really get that i think with taiko because you see it because everything is so kinetic there's no sound that doesn't come with like a giant like arm swing i had this friend who used to say that like it doesn't matter what it is the moment you add a drummer that's when it becomes a band and the reason why is i think because you just have that real kineticism that's you know sight and, and sound that are like fused together into one thing tangents way off on the side yeah. no but that's because it well it seems like it's the it's not just the the music itself, like with, with your music, there's an entertaining portion that's important to you. And w when I'm on stage, I'm always watching our drummer. He's the fun one for me to watch. Um, yeah, well, I'm I'm an old fuck, you know. Uh, but when I grew up, it was like it was all uh, punk bands, and you know, that was the thing. And it was like if you were going to go on stage, you were expected to like you know climb the rafters and like swing the microphone around your head and like you know stage dive and take a swing at someone in the audience like it was like you had to put you were supposed to put on a show and if you didn't do that it was like Pfft. and then you know like pavement came along and not a mouse and made everything hella fucking boring and it was like oh shoegaze look at my shoes because i'm embarrassed to be on stage and it's like god get off the fucking stage then you're so boring and so to me everything has always been like if it isn't entertaining if it doesn't have that kineticism if it doesn't like have that like you can't look away spectacle factor then get it off the fucking stage like it has no point being there like you know there's lots of art that's best absorbed through other mediums but in a live environment i want something that like is i cannot look away from like a fucking car wreck and you know that's that should be the uh i feel that should be the the sort of like you know the what you're trying to bring out of it and there's lots of ways to bring out of it some performers are just so their personality is so hypnotic, you can't look away. That can mm -hmm. still function. Some, it's like their antics are so extreme, you can't look away. Some, it's their skill is so prodigious, you can't look away. But the thing is, if, if you can look away, like if the audience ha can look away, if they're not completely mag 
hypnotized, then like you're doing something wrong and you should figure out what it is and change it. But you know, that's just one of Josh's very strong, unreasonably strong opinions of which there are a great many. Yeah, I was asking, uh, I, I asked our mutual friend Derek Dion for what, what question should I ask Josh? And he said, well, Josh can argue about anything with anyone. He has strong opinions about everything. <laughs> and whatever we are 10 yeah. minutes into this, it, it's, uh, yeah, that's pretty obvious. But, uh, yeah, well, we'll get to my, my show and tell object, and I think that'll make more sense. But uh, perfect. go on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, the entertaining thing, I think I am from, let's talk about Puppeteers for Fears because I saw a production sure. you did last summer you did a uh, cattle mutilation the musical and like you're saying i could not take my eyes off the stage that was yeah. engaging as hell and i i for weeks afterwards i was telling everyone about it brielle my bandmate and we, we still quote lines from it to this day um i can't Thank believe you. that a touring production of something like puppeteers for fears can be done on a kind of a diy scale that you guys somehow pull it off i i just kind of want you to talk about um yeah walk, walk us through how you assemble these shows how many people are involved like are you doing the music so, and run yourself are you making the puppets yeah, i'm yeah. so curious about everything so um for the uninitiated puppeteers for fears is a musical theater company i started uh, a number of years ago uh it's does science fiction horror uh musical comedies with puppets and a live band um we've done we do features primarily and um, we were sort of lucky enough in around like 2017, 2018 to start taking the show out on the road um, away from our hometown and do some several West Coast tours. Um, the show has usually requires about a dozen people to make happen on stage. Um, so it's usually there's a team of like five to seven puppeteers, depending on what the what the show is, and a, a band of three or four pieces. I think we've always done three or four piece bands, and then a couple of crew people, um, and then we cram that all in a van and we drive it around and set up in rock clubs and do this insane show for people. Um, it came together because, I mean, I'll just give you the whole overview sort of backstory yeah. and just jump in with questions anytime you you want to know something. So. I mean, I had been playing and grew up playing in bands and it was just a thing. Writing songs was always a thing that I'd done. Um, and then at a certain point in college, I sort of got into writing novels and plays. And somewhere along the line, I thought it would be fun to try to write a musical just to see if I could bring those two things together. And the one sort of problem is that I hated most musicals. Like I, I would see them and I would, and I would see like, you know, West Side Story, they're walking down the street and, like, <laughs> and I was like, that's fucking stupid. That's not, that doesn't happen. Like, no one would do that. That's dumb. And I didn't get, um, like, a, a lot of musicals, like, mostly because I felt like a lot of music kind of came out of context. And I felt like it needed to be something ridiculous. It needed to be absurd or, like, fourth wall breaking. And uh, I was living in Boise for a while, and there was a theater company there that uh, asked me to contribute uh, something that I'd, I'd done some work with them. They asked me to contribute a piece for their Halloween show that they decided was going to be uh, a series of short horror pup, puppet horror shows. And uh, By I piece, they just want myself, you to to write music for it or they want you to do a whole no, they're, story? They're just, they were just reaching out to people they knew and they're like, hey, we're going to do we want, we're going to do uh, short puppet horror pieces. Can you write one for us? Okay. And so they got like three different people to write one for them. And I was one of the people they asked. And as I was sort of thinking, it was like, okay, puppet horror musical, that's ridiculous enough to work. And I then sort of reached out to all of my friends on social media. I was like, what's the worst topic for a musical you can imagine? Like, so like the thing that would just be the absolute worst that you cannot imagine. And they somehow settled on serial killers. So I wrote this 10 minute short called ritual murder, the musical that was about uh, basically a sort of satire of Silence of the Lambs in which the killer was like, had the, you know, victim in, in the pit in his basement and was like singing this song about his process of like vivisecting them. And um, it worked. It was, it was it kind of just as ridiculous as I thought it would be. And it, and it, it worked for me as a musical. And I performed the whole thing, I think, with just a ukulele. Um, and the next year they asked me to do it again. And so I wrote one about werewolves that was kind of followed the plot of Greece. Uh, and then the third year I did one 
that was going to be about mummies, um, just because I thought it'd be really funny to have a character that couldn't sing because they had bandages in their mouth. That was really the oh, only. Oh, that's a good gag. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, the whole gag was just like that. That'll last the whole play, you guys. <laughs> Trust me, it'll be great. Uh, and then I ended up moving away, so I never got to perform that one. So I just had that in my back pocket, and I'd written all the songs for it. And at that point, I'd kind of gotten a, I'd start to understand it a little bit better, so I'd gotten better at it. And I was like, okay, well, that's a shame. And then I moved back home uh, to Ashland, where I grew up, which is a big theater town. We have the uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival is here. And so because the Oregon Shakespeare Festival is here, there's a really robust theater program at the university, so there's a lot of just actors around kind of looking for something to do. Um, and... It was coming up on Halloween, and I just sort of thought to myself, you know, man, it'd be fun to do all three of these together as one piece, mm -hmm. like a trilogy, just because the first, the third one never got performed, and then, you know, but we could, it's not long enough on its own, but we could, because these are all shorts, but we could pack it with the other two, do one whole thing, and just do that as a one night Halloween show. That'd be like a fun thing to do. And they just started kind of like, poking around asking some friends and I asked like some members of my old high school band like uh if we did it if I was going to do this would you play in the band and they're like yeah sure why not and then uh you know I was just in a bar this uh weird little bar called Oberon's which is like a renaissance it's like a re if renaissance fair were a bar it's just like a place for strange people to hang out and do strange things I I, I played there it was a weird little place it's an odd little place yeah and uh, I saw this girl that I had uh I had seen in a play once and I thought she was, uh, she was good. And I was like, you know what? Fucking why not? Caution to the wind. And I just walked up and I tapped her on the shoulder and I just said, Hey, I saw you in a play once you're really good. Here's a crazy idea. And I just threw, like monologued at her and through this whole pitch. And it turned out she had studied puppetry in college. Wow. And so I just tapped the right person on the shoulder by dumb fucking luck. And so she called a couple of her friends uh, from school. Uh, I called the members of my high school band and we, and we kind of like did these very tentative like rehearsal sessions. And then the bass player in my high school band, he had married a woman who did professional like seamstress work. So she volunteered to make, so she made some puppets. Um, we did this thing and we booked it for Oberon's and we were just going to do this. It would be like one or two nights, like this sort of small little thing. And then like, Oberon's can fit about 40 people and about 150 showed up and there was just like lines out the door and the and stage can maybe hold two people but somehow five piece of bands and more fit on yeah it. yeah it was like I mean, stages and then we had the band up in the, the balcony where they stored like the equipment um and what happened afterwards is that uh, you know this this gets into my sort of broader cultural critique but you know Ashland kind of lives in the town the shadow Shakespeare, uh, in that, and everything is what, it, and I, in a lot of ways, feel that, like, despite the fact that there's a lot of really smart people here with um, their own, with something to say and a lot of talent, uh, the primary industry of the town is the Shakespeare Festival, which is what I call, you know, plays written by dead people, starring actors from New York for audiences that drove in from California. And so, for a lot of folks wow. who live here, you feel very much like you don't actually have your own cultural voice because any time you try to do something of your own, they say like, "Well, I don't get it. This isn't Shakespeare." And we're like, "I know. That's the point. It isn't Shakespeare." And um, when we did the show. Afterwards, people just kept coming up to us and saying, like, thank you for doing anything different. Thank you for doing <laughs> anything different. And it was like, all right, I guess people are into this, so let's try it again. So I wrote another show, and we booked it again, and we booked it for two weeks this time, and the whole thing sold out. So we wrote another one, booked it for three weeks, and then not, every, like, every time it was like they would have, like, have, like, a clicker at the door. To, and Oberon's is not a big place, so I feel like I needed, when I say, like, oh, line's out the door. Like, it doesn't take much to get a line out the door, but we were doing it three weekends in a row. And we kept outgrowing all the spaces, and at a certain point, it was like, okay, I guess we're going to try to take this on the road then or something. So we tried we tried the next, you know, town over, and then people coming. We tried the next town over, and people kept coming. And then uh, I'd seen a uh, thing at the... Uh, and we kind of like talked, and once we'd gone like one or two towns over, you know, it was like, okay, we kind of have an idea of how to like pop this in the van and make it modular because, you know, everything in Oberon's is very compact anyhow. So we had to kind of figure out how to pick it up and put it down and move it really quickly. And then we figured out how to get it to two towns over. And then we're like, all right, you know, I've been playing in bands all my life. This is basically bigger. It's like the size of a ska band. So it's like bringing a horn section or something, you know, like, so can we do this? 
And uh, we talked about the idea of like, if it would be what people would think about going on tour and everyone seemed all into it. Cause they were, you know, they're just like, no one really kind of knew. We had no, we had no idea of like how hard it would be other than, so it was more like a, just a, well, why not? You know? Yeah. So we called, so we ended up getting into the Hollywood fringe festival uh, with our production of Cthulhu, the musical, which is an adaptation of an HP Lovecraft short story. And that's in LA, which is, you know, uh, 800,000 miles away from where we live. So we figured, you know, well, fuck it. Then we'll just, we'll, you know, we have to get there and back anyway. Let's do more shows, which is, just turned into a two week tour and um people were really so into that show that like everywhere we went like the hollywood fringe festival sold out a month in advance all four shows uh and everywhere we went it was basically sold out that was largely because we were doing cthulhu which has like a big cultural anchor in people's minds so it kind mm-hmm. of marketed itself but it just kept more people kept kept coming and um so then we just did it again and, uh, you know, with Cattle Mutilation, which was another one of our pieces early that we've done before. And then, uh, you know, did the whole West Coast thing again. And then uh, ended the pandemic had, so now it's kind of all sidelined. And I don't know if it will be coming back because it took so many people to make happen. But, it, um, I mean, to make it happen, it was really like, I mean, one, it was dumb luck. You got to meet the right people at the right time. Two, uh, there was a thing that people were into that, uh, you know, like there was, they were into it in a way that like kind of kept them emotionally invested. And because it kind of hit a lot of these cultural points, like um, had a sort of Venn overlapping Venn diagram of like, you know, nostalgia and kitsch and like things that people liked, it kind of like brought in a bunch of odd audiences. And that meant that like the people involved were making enough money from it, that it wasn't like this oh, total waste of their time, you know, like and that, and that includes you. Was it profitable for you guys? I, you don't I have mean, to get into hard all, numbers, but there's, I'm sure there's well, hours going into rehearsing and yeah. They were all profitable, but it was like, no one would make anything approaching what was minimum wage, you know, but it was like, usually you, your band plays like a show and you don't, and you lose money on it. And this you'd make like 15 bucks, you know, like, sure. but the thing is like at the end of a tour, at the end of the tour, I think everyone got like 800 or a thousand dollars, you know, which, yeah. which is not bad for uh the end of a tour especially when you're realizing that's a 14-way split you know right like, it's it's bad when you realize it, it, that was you know being on the road for a month non up you know so it's like you know if you do this sort of hourly on that it's just it's terrible but like that wasn't the point the point was like you could have gone on the road for a month and made nothing like we had yeah we actually had a, one or two friends who i think for one of the, we had one of the musicians had to drop out at the last second. We had to swap him out with someone. And, uh, I tried to recruit a friend of mine and he said he couldn't do it because he was touring with his other band at basically the exact same time. And so we did this comparison and our shows all were sold out and like made money. And then he came back from his and they, they had had a great time, but you know, he, I think he made like $28 for like a month on the road, you know? And it's so we made money, but like, it, you know, not like nothing you could live off of, but it's also like the, you know, some of that's proportional to like with puppets, like the character is only, you know, two and a half, three feet tall. So you can't get in a, a room that's so big that people can't see it. So you have like some limitations on how big an audience can be. And, you know, uh, puppetry is also very uh, physically intensive uh, medium. So there's some limitations on how many shows you can. And really a lot of it was just how many shows you can do, how many shows can you do and how many people can you get in? And that's, you know, the math of how much money you make. And it's, it's, it takes a lot. Uh, it took a lot to make happen. And it actually took so much to make happen that I'm not entirely sure whether we'll ever be able to do it again, because it was like kind of dumb luck and a miracle intersecting with one another that it happened at all. Uh, and I don't know that that's something that can ever, you know, be resurrected post pandemic. It's just too much was knocked out too much of the legs were knocked out, but feel free with any follow-ups if I didn't hit any of the points you're wondering about. Yeah, well, let's. So up until the point you tap your friend at, uh, on the shoulder at Oberon's, you were doing all of this yourself, and at this point, a lot more people start to get involved. So I want to ask about the collaboration. Where, um, yeah, kind of how <clears throat> how open were are you to your ideas being changed? Because I'm sure, like the puppet character <clears throat> designs, you didn't know exactly what they looked like. Do you just put that on the hands of other people, or are you overseeing every part of the process? And is this your baby from? Yeah, from A to Z, every part of the production. 
So that's a complicated question and one I'm sure you would get different answers from depending on who you asked. I, right. you know, um, it's in any collaboration, you have to like surrender a lot of control. That's just the way it is. And especially at the start, um, like my very first thing was, uh, I like technically I, I directed the first show, but my style of directing was really to just smile and laugh because I kept thinking like, oh man, a stiff breeze could kill this. So nobody quit. So don't say anything that would make anybody quit. And so I just said, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And that was like it. That was it. And at a certain point, I think they were, the, the actors were kind of like, you need to direct us. And I'm like, no, you're doing great. You got it. You, you know what to do. Yeah. But, you know, uh, but, but at the same time, like when you're, I mean, there's a this, this sort of cliche of like the writer having their material sort of like messed with and altered against the will is it's, it's a cliche for a reason, but you do have to surrender control. And with most of these things, the thing I just sort of realized was most of these people are better at what they do than I could ever hope to be or hope to understand. Mm -hmm. So better to just let them to just to, to do as little micromanaging as possible and to let them to like give them a job and don't interfere with it unless there's a material reason to. So like, there are definitely there were definitely a handful of things that I've been a stickler about. I think like what I would say like yes, I'm going to be a stickler about this, but there's usually a reason, and the reason isn't always necessarily clearly evident to, to everyone else. But if it's not arbitrary and it's not like uh, my fucking precious ego, like like okay, for example, um, when we. <laughs> Like we have some recordings of uh, like whenever we performed at this place in Corvallis called the Majestic Theater, we've been lucky enough to get it on video and we have recordings and I can look at the recordings and go and see like, oh, look at that. There's like all of this stuff that isn't in the script. It's because they were just ad libbing on stage. And some of the ad libs on stage were some, I mean, the production of cattle mutilation that you saw in uh, Seattle, um, there are, I think, like two or three whole characters in the play that are not in the script that they just the actors just made up like in the process of rehearsing it and the thing was it was funny it was good so it's like if it's good and it's funny why would i why would i say take it out you know like mm -hmm. keep it going i mean i wasn't the director for that one so it wasn't really my job to say one way or the other generally uh, but generally if it's additive rather than subjective then let it happen you know especially when those people know the puppeteers know puppeteering better than i ever could the puppet designers are better than I ever could be. And, you know, motions, they're able to focus on just playing their instrument rather than having to sort of like think about the holistic thing of how everything fits together so they can come up with something more interesting on its own. And it only becomes a problem if it's distracting from the whole piece, you know, like everyone's kind of, everyone's got to be a cog, you know, you know, like the part, something like that. So, I would say uh, I'm pretty open to it as long as it's uh, additive, but you know, artistic egos always clash and other people might say otherwise, especially with, you know, on the blank situation. But that's, I think that's every, uh, true of anything. You remember the one, you remember the battles you lost, not necessarily the ones you said like, yeah, let's not even bother fighting this. Right. Yeah. You and know? you have to pick the battles where like, maybe you're saying like, all right, well, I need this, song not a lyric can change it's more of the story it's the height of this thing but maybe the way that this piece of the set is designed i i don't care about as much you you pick the things that are worth fighting yeah for. well and plus you know that there's there's kind of two primary motivations for like a project it's like either your heart's in it or you're getting a paycheck from it mm -hmm. and my view is that unless that paycheck is like actually paying your rent then like you know, at that point, you're still kind of like, you have to keep people's hearts in it. Once their rent's on the, you know, it's like, this is your, you're making $30,000 a year. At that point, you can say, look, motherfucker, this is how it is. You need to do it this way. You know, because at that point, it's like you, the, 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 the bargain has changed. That's right. not an argument to be a shitty, like, manager. It's just saying, like, you know, the, the math is different. Up until that point, it's still people are somewhat, like, saying, like, this is my side gig and I make, and not my, where my, uh, my, my rent is getting paid, so I may need to leave any time. So you got to keep their heart in it. And a lot of that means like letting them ex be in it for their own reasons and explore the things they want to explore and having it be more fun than it is work. And so, you know, uh, I guess it's when it becomes work, when it becomes like real challenging and slog, that's when it's like, well, it's got to pay off. 
in some other way. And uh, that's harder to do with a project like that just because it's so labor intensive to make happen that um, it's really challenging to ever make it really pay financially in the way that it would have, you would ever actually deserve without much bigger backing than we've ever had. You know, it's still, it's a scrappy, weird, you know, DIY punk rock puppet show. It, you know, it's like those, that's not really what people are getting rich off of. Well, it, it's kind of the charm of it too. If it was a big, well, whatever, yeah, Port Portland theater group that was pointed it on, it wouldn't have the same charm as just, these are guys who are doing this for the passion and, and it, what, what I expected to see when I heard this is a punk rock touring puppet show, just some guys made yeah, I, I'm sure the thing in my mind is not what I saw. It was like a traditional, like whatever three, three act structure. The songs were great. And as stupid as it is to say out loud, like the puppets on stage, there's a certain suspension of disbelief where like the puppeteers yeah. are so good. I, I believe what I'm seeing on stage. And I, there, there's a story I can get invested in where on, on paper, if I say, Oh, there's just these, random dudes who are throwing together a puppet show. It's two and a half hours long. Do you want to go to them? Like, that sounds like something I don't want to see, but like, no, yeah, it, I, yeah. but yeah, when, when you're there, it's in, and it sounds like it's a fun thing to be a part of. I know you're not, you guys aren't just doing the shows when you're traveling. You also like hit up water parks and break, break your arm before a show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I did. Uh, I dislocated my shoulder at a water park though. And then still played drums that night actually. But um, yeah, that was a, that was a fun day. Um, yeah, well, it's like if you're if you're out on like the road on something like that. I mean, like I, it, the road can be wearying and exhausting, and you gotta like you know find your fun along the way. And remember that like like these are people for the most part these are people you like, and if you don't like them, maybe you probably shouldn't be working with them. You know, in a project like that, and it's like ways of sort of making it value added, especially since like the road can be such a slog. Mm -hmm. You know. And like the, to me, the best, the best thing we did on tour actually was, um, the water park was fun, but the best thing was we had like a, uh, two days off in, in like central California. And it was like, we could basically just hang out somewhere or we could do something with them. So we decided to go to Yosemite. Oh, and perfect. so like we all went camped at Yosemite for one night and basically just, and went on these crazy like hikes that were like going into like Tolkien, you know, Tolkien land of like, you know, up like waterfalls, up like giant cliffs. And we we're just like, what? We're, we're, a touring, we're a touring puppet show. Like, this is not real life. You know, like at a certain point, I actually went told by the, the, you know, the people on the tour, it's like, look guys, I like you. I think you're all very talented. And I hope that what I'm about to say isn't true, but this may be the coolest thing you ever do in your life. And you should really try to enjoy it. Yeah. You know, cause like someone was like having like a sour day and I was like, dude, the worst day you're going to have on this tour is better than the best day you're going to have, you know, because like we're just doing something that defies all reason and the odds. And we should, you know, maybe it's just, you need a little perspective of like how of having gone into empty rooms to see like what a big deal that is. But I don't know. I think performers and that were very, very talented, probably far more talented than myself. So I think, you know, they'll all, they'll, I don't know that they'll know the terror of an empty stage or an empty room. Uh, very often, so but that's that. Yeah, well, it sounds like you guys but, become like a family said, doing these touring things too. So I, I hope it happens again in the future, just because I selfishly I want to see it again. But I know it's a lot of work. So whatever projects yeah. are coming, uh, I yeah, I could talk well, about puppeteers for thing, fears forever, but we should probably move on. So to, I will say the big the thing with, with that is we've been trying to we've been trying to find a way to translate it since it is so labor intensive. There needs to be a way. If to keep it going, it needs to pay off more. So yeah. we've been trying to find a way to see if we could actually like pitch it as like a, a TV show or a film or something. So it could be oh, like kind be of cool. like a hybrid. Um, but so far that's been really challenging because, you know, uh, the media world has the same sort of skepticism of puppetry uh, that you described earlier where they're like, ah, a punk rock, I don't know. Eh, you know, but like, then you see it, you get it. Um, but the problem is you have to get people there to see it, to get it. And that's not going to happen right now. But uh, that is in the future. We've been trying to pitch, uh, pitch it as a TV show or a movie. Uh, but as a stage show, it's, it's definitely on hiatus, extended yeah. hiatus for, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, I could see someone at adult swim being for it, but obviously that that's a tough pitch to get to them. Yeah. You don't just walk up to adult swim and be like, yo, bitches. 
<laughs> is open to talk about some puppets. Yeah. <laughs> Got some ideas and want to run by you. Yeah. Although I'll... they are in Atlanta. They're in Atlanta. And I yeah. think after, after one show, a guy walked up to us and did say, you do very well in Atlanta. And I was like, well, geez, I've always hoped to make it to Atlanta. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, but, that's uh, motivation to get it on the road think... again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, well, you're right. turn... Next. Yeah, cool. Uh, you're doing a bunch of mu- music collaborations right now over email. You sent me a link to s- some of the things you're doing. Um, you've been in tons of different bands. How is collaborating over email different than just being in a room together? Obviously, it moves slower, but do you feel like the process itself yeah. affects the art? It definitely does. Cause I mean, like, I mean, the single biggest way is like the concept of like jamming sort of ceases to exist, you know, mm-hmm. like so much, so many songs where it's really like you come in and you're like, w- when you're working with people and then you're in a room and you're like, all right, I got like a riff and you start playing a riff and then they sort of start adding something to it and you start sort of like moving around and like feeling it out and seeing where it goes and just like letting it lead places and collaborations. Now it's much more like I send you, I send you a thing you play something to it, you send it back. Maybe we tweak it once or twice after that, but there's, but it doesn't meander as much. So you kind of have to, you either have to have a more formed product in mind from the get go, or you have to sort of surrender a lot more of the like, all right, I'm sending you something and you just do whatever the fuck you want to it. And we'll see where that goes. And like the two main projects, uh, the two main uh, online collaborations I've been doing during the quarantine, like one of them, it's real, like, uh, it's uh, my old garage rock band. My dr- the, it ended because the drummer moved to Tokyo. And so now he lives there and he's got this tiny little like MIDI drum set. So like I'll just play a song to a click track. I'll send it to him. He'll play drums. He'll send it back to me. Um, I'll basically like replay whatever I did and add a few other instruments to like, you know, so it's not, so it's moved up from like a demo to an actual thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then maybe he'll like tighten or tweak or the drums a little bit like that. But it's basically like I send him a song, he plays the drums to it. I adjust slightly to, to like be intent to, to like match whatever like accents he added. And, you know, but that's pretty much like, here's a final project, you know? Yeah. It's more and rigid. The other you one, can't write in a room together. It's like, and yeah. normally you maybe come with a, a song 20% finished. You have to have it pretty much 80% finished. If you're recording something and sending it over for them to play to. Otherwise they're like, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. This. Yeah. It's, yeah, so it's, that one's like, it's a lot more regimented. And, um, you know, we do like weekly zoom meetings to kind of like talk out whatever it is. And it's been a lot of fun. Cause I just, we have a good, like, uh, we just work really well together. And then the other one I've been working on is the polar opposite where it's like, um, there's a singer I know and she, uh, she's always been in like big, loud, like psych rock bands. And she just said that she's really into this, um, electronic group called glass candy. And she just always wanted to do some electronic stuff like that. And I was like, Oh cool. I love glass candy. Let's do something like that. So basically I, so like a couple, at first I was kind of like, okay, well do you have like songs that you've written and you want like backing tracks put together? And she doesn't, and she, it's just the same. So she doesn't really think in turn in the same terms. It's more like she can hear things in her melodies and sort of go. With it. So like maybe she hummed me something a couple times and I was like, okay, I'm just going to whatever go off. And so I would just come up with like basically like a two bar, like drum and bass loop, like a little like r- groove on the bass or like a, you know, like a kick drum pattern or something like that. I'd send it to her as like a five minute, like repeating loop. And yeah. she'd send back a vocal track of her, you know, like either, Sometimes it was freestyle. Sometimes it was stuff she'd written out. Um, and then I'd take that and chop it up, chop up her vocals and to make into like verse chorus structures and then add in all these other instruments to turn them into sort of like fully fleshed out, you know, three to five minute, like electronic uh, dance pop songs, which is, you know, so that's the a lot of work. Of what... you, yeah. You, you say yeah. that just in like two or three sentences, but the amount of time it takes to do that, it's a lot. It is, but it's like it, but it's, it's, goes, it's some of it goes a lot faster than it, you think. I mean, partially because we're kind of doing a lo fi thing. So it's mm-hmm. like when, once you decide to go lo fi, you cut out a lot of the like dithering of like oh, about the 0.75 EQ 2 dB boost, you know, like, right, oh right. God, who cares? Like, you know, um, but it's, it, but, but it's like the way her mind works, it's like she, what she's sending is close enough already that usually it's just like, okay, well, let's just chop out this little bit here because it's like, 
it's kind of like a repeat of what happened earlier and it's just too long. And then it's, you know, add a few cool sounds or something. But yeah, it, it is a lot more work, but it's interesting that the two projects are such polar opposites, you know? Right. But yeah, it's been, uh, and that one's but not it's like, like, like we can't be, you can't be in a room. That, that, that's the thing that is. No, no. Astrofauna was, um, no, Astrofauna was a band, uh, that our album came out at the start of this year. And that was like, was in that band for several years beforehand at the same time. And it kind of like, yeah. Astrofauna was like, whenever I wasn't on tour with, thing. yeah, that was like, whenever I wasn't on tour with, uh, Puppet for Fears, I was mostly working on that. Um, and that was, it started as, uh, a singer I knew. She had a, I had, she did some just like, a, uh, vocal tracks on another thing and, I, and she said something like yeah this is my first time ever recording and I was like really you're like insanely good how have you never recorded <laughs> yeah. anything before she's like I don't know it's just never come up and I was like well let's do it right now and so we found a couple of the songs that she sing, sing at karaoke and I had her you know downloaded it had her sing that and then I just ran the karaoke track through like a bunch of insane like studio filters to mm. like mutilate it so it didn't sound anything like the karaoke track and we're like, that was kind of cool. We just made like this whole new style of like insane space. She likes to sing soul music. So we made this sort of like space soul, you know, what we could. That and uh, like, that's fun. And then it kind of like, so we started playing with that. And then we kind of recruited like a full four piece band. And we were trying to do it with like uh, this analog synthesizer that I have. And uh, the band sort of fell out sort of one of one of them had to move away and the other one got busy with another project. So it came back to just the, me and the singer sort of re-envisioned it a third time as just, um, you know, it was basically like a, a drum machine analog synth on play, playing bass loops and then me playing guitar. And then we did the whole thing as an album as like sort of one like long uninterrupted uh, piece. And then that album we kind of worked on uh, on and off for a while. And then it came out right at the start of the year, right as the pandemic happened. And so there's no way to promote it. And it wasn't like a band that like a lot of people really followed because there wasn't just a, a lot of places to play. But I love, but that's one of my favorite things I've done in a long time. I just love the sound of it. Yeah, you mentioned, and I, because I want to touch on that, it, it not getting noticed thing. I, well, one of the things I struggle with as a creative person is that we sink so much time into the, what time, effort, and money into the creation of the art, making that exist at a high level. Like we, we record everything ourselves, but we, to make it a little bit better, we'll pay someone to mix it, pay someone to master it and make that everything sound better. If we do music videos, that can be expensive. By the time we have the finished product we're super proud of, there's no budget to promote it. So we, we, we can't afford to hire a PR marketing company. Some of those campaigns you're paying at least two grand to get it out there and i can't take that risk because maybe this little this magazine will write something cool about you but that doesn't turn back into i don't get my money back for that it's maybe a blurb i could put on my website so we rely on word of mouth either of ourselves on social media or, and our fans or whatever lucky breaks we can get from e emails we send ourselves to radio stations what are so what are you doing when you when you put out astrofauna are you to promote yourself you're, you're proud of this work because puppeteers for fears you guys seem to market that pretty well and get good returns why didn't yeah. astrofauna work well uh, <laughs> that's a great, uh yeah so it's I mean, an on the spot I question did, but i i'm I, it's the thing i'm so curious i don't know how to get my work noticed i'm curious what have you know what works for you what's failed i mean so many so many books have been written about this i, I know, actually yeah. sometimes teach a works I actually teach a workshop sometimes called marketing for creatives. Cause I used to be an arts reporter for the paper. Mm. Uh, so it'd be like a, why do things work? Why do they not work? How is it that so many artists can be so talented and yet not understand how to send out a press release, you know? <laughs> yeah. So try to talk about that stuff. So like with puppeteers for fears, it's like we would do press releases, you know, we'd send out like photos, uh, send out samples of the cast album, we'd invite reports to opening night, all of the stuff that you do. You know, it's like, there's, it's really not rocket science. There's a template you can follow. It's pretty simple. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to do a lot of legwork to try to track things down. But ultimately, the reason it worked had nothing to do with any of those things. It had to do with two things. Like it had to do with like, what, uh, 
uh, Malcolm Gladwell calls stickiness, like sticky concepts. And, you know, the, the thing is you hear pup, the, te- the term puppeteers for fears. You immediately know what it is. Mm. You immediately know whether you like it and are interested in it or not. And you immediately know that it's puppets, it's horror, it's cheeky. And it hits all those things. And it's clever enough that people go like, I like that. I want to see what it is, you know. And the other thing is that because puppeteers for fears had, you know, 12, 15 people involved at any given time, it's like, okay, it, the whole sort of like classic thing is like, all right, here's the deal, band. Everyone has to bring three friends, right? Oh, right. But the yeah. thing is, if you're a three piece and you bring three friends, that's nine people. If you're a 15 piece theater company and everyone brings three, and suddenly you have a full house. The full house comes on for the first night. They go, holy shit, that was great. We're going to go to all our friends to go see it, and so on. The nine people who come to see the three piece band go, man, this show is dead. I'm not telling anyone to come see this. <laughs> So like some of it is just like the whole thing is like it's people, all of marketing is trying to bring people together. It's the people connector. And if you have a large group to start with, you already have this thing. And it, people look on stage and they say, wow, this looks like a cool gang of best friends. You know, like yeah. I, they look like they're having a great time. I want to be part of that. You know, like my, you know, like the, my high school band was a, was a cool gang of best friends and people still 25 years later are obsessed with this fucking thing because they, when they would see it, they'd be like, you guys look like you're having so much fun. Cause you're like such good friends. So it's like, yeah, that's what it is. And then in my solo project, which is, I, I think far more sophisticated, more interesting music. It's like, Oh, that's the weird kid eating lunch by himself. I don't want to go over there. No, then, you know, that's where the nerds are. And, uh, when all, it it's doesn't a have lot a of stickiness it is, to it. It's, it's Puppeteers for Fear is a puppet horror musical thing. Yeah, it's, but it, it has it's a lot an, more cachet than I'm doing an indie music project. You're it's yeah. a saturated field. You're competing with everyone. Yeah, it's got to stay yeah. in out in some way. It's but it's, so it's this intersection of a lot of different things. But I mean, like with bands, it's like there's a lot of bands now. Uh, mm-hmm. Live music does not and music does not have the same sort of like cultural cachet that it used to because it's so much easier to start a band and make music than it used to be. And there's so many other ways to listen to music. It used to be, you know, if there, you wanted music in a restaurant, you had the musicians. That was full stop. That was just how it worked. Um, and so, you know, it's not as, as big a deal as it once was. There's other ways to go out and do things. There's other ways to go out and meet people to date. There's, I mean, like most of the people, like venue owners will tell you that, you know, 20 years ago, people were coming to their clubs not necessarily because they liked the music but because they wanted to find to find people to to date and that's the, now that you do that on an app so oh, you don't right. necessarily you don't need bands the same way that you used to so it ha- it's harder to like so the music has to be marketed solely on its own strength and a lot of that is really just uh how much sort of cultural penetration do you have and cultural penetration comes from a lot of different things it comes from the media it comes from word of mouth and it comes from visibility so if you play a lot of shows, you're visible. If you have play shows that people talk about, you have word of mouth. If you have, uh, you know, like media penetration, then it's a thing that people see and you have some combination of those things, but that still doesn't mean that it catches on. So, I mean, like Astrofauna did not play very often. We played maybe once every six months and those shows were oddly attended and it was, you know, uh, what we were doing was so out of step locally that it was hard to sort of like really tie into sort of any larger thing. So it never really caught on, you know, but this is, I mean, this is my analysis, never really caught on. And when we did release the album, we were unable to do a lot of the things that you do to promote an album. Like when you release an album, you go out and you tour, which we couldn't do. Uh, You know, you, uh, and then you get it in front of people. I did all the same stuff, you know, like I sent out press releases, I sent out sample tracks I did to the media, I contacted other people, but it didn't have like, there wasn't a bunch of people chomping at the bit for that album. And then there wasn't a lot of ways to promote it. it I mean, I'm not upset about it. If you're going to make things, you have to be prepared for them to fail. And, you know, one of the things I sometimes like to do is to not focus as much on the sort of like fine tooth, like extremely expensive details because you know if i'm if i expect that they're probably not going to do well then like why should i waste a bunch of time and energy and money on you know trying to like you know finally polish a thing that it's going to look at i just want to do the version of it that i'm like going to be say like cool i feel that i've done that and i can move on 
Yeah. And, you know, and then if people are really into it, then I'll go, okay, if this is the thing you guys are into, then I'll pour my time and energy and effort into that. And uh, I was really proud of the Astrofauna album, but it's also like, you know, it's definitely got some rough edges, but, sure. uh, but I was really proud of it because it partially just cause it was like music I hadn't heard before in, in a way that I thought was interesting, you know? And I just thought it was fun. I like, I, I'd always loved analog synthesizers and I finally got to make an album with one, you know? Yeah. The synths were cool. I maybe just me self as a guitar player. You do all these kind of cool, I don't know if it's the tremolo bar kind of coming down, but all these kind of just bends and like, just sound, this, the guitar sound tapes were really nice too. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, oh, but yeah, thank you very yeah, much. For, for people who haven't heard that, we'll, we'll definitely link that in the description here. So hopefully more people can uh, get turned on to that. Let's talk cool. books. You have. Books, let's talk them. Yeah. Uh, your next novel, Summer of Smoke, uh, comes out next year, date to be determined. I know we're, you're waiting on a couple final things for it. Um, yeah, just, it's. It, it's been done for a while. I mean, the, the book has been done for a while. I've been waiting on the illustrations for the chapter heads have taken a lot longer uh, than expected. Uh, that's really, so it's, you know, being pushed back. And I'm once, and the, if we're down to like the last handful of them, but once, even once they're done, I need to then give three months, a three month window for, you know, just for marketing and promotion stuff, yeah. because I take this book, I want this book to do, to have some chance to do well. And then I'd really love to be able to actually do a launch slash release party. And I don't know. And to do that, you know, some of the pandemic restrictions need to be lifted or pulled back on to do it the way I want to do it anyway. Right. Well, I hope that happens. I usually hate questions about what inspired certain art uh, or where you get your ideas from. Cause normally there isn't a good answer. Just like, I don't know. Just, I thought of it. There's no interesting story behind it, but this one, it seems to have come of it from a very specific place turning some real life tragedy yeah. into, into comedy. And I'm hoping you can just talk about writing this book. Sure. Yeah. So, um, summer smoke, uh, is a novel that is inspired about the inspired by the summer of 2018 here in Southern Oregon. Um, uh, I don't know what it was like for uh, y'all up in Seattle, but, you know, we've had really heavy forest fire smoke the last couple summers. Yeah. And in 2018, the smoke lasted for about three months. Like, and it was like three months of like all day long, thick fog of toxic air. Uh, and it wasn't just like, Oh, look at that. Like it's cloudy out or, you know, it was like, you couldn't see more than like 500 yards in the distance and you couldn't go outside without like a brief, you know, like a mask. Um, which now everyone doesn't think is quite as like crazy as at the time, but like, no, but I you remember know, but you, but the I, air was lit. I, I toured through Ashland and Medford that summer, like that August. And it was, it was bad in Seattle, but when we arrived in Southern Oregon, it's like, holy shit, this yeah. is not it's, fun. Yeah, it's like yeah. the, basically the way the mountains are shaped, it's like the, the air just sat in the valley and just like a little pool of toxic sludge. And, um, what, but what's frustrating uh, was that it was like, it felt like living in this sort of like surrealist sci-fi apocalyptic, you know, film, like every day was just like, like really, really weird. And, you know, the entire time, like your, you know, like your like lizard brain was like going off with this, like, ah, run, you've seen Bambi, you know how this ends, you know, like, um, and so it was this really strange time to live through because it really felt like the world was ending. And I was like, that's, that's, that's like, just, just as a crazy sort of environment. And, uh, my girlfriend and I, we drove up into the mountains to kind of get above the smoke for like a day and just to get some clear air. And while we were up there, I, or we were talking about how I'd seen in the media, I'd seen, uh, basically the, the wind turned and like blew the smoke South to San Francisco. And the, the day the, the smoke hit San Francisco, suddenly it was front page news in like the New York mm. Times and the San Francisco Chronicle. Basically every major media outlet was like forest fire smoke. And, and it was like, and then for the next like three days, there was like a rehash of every single story is, that they'd done locally about like the fashion of smoke masks and like the impact of businesses and like what about public health and all this stuff. And I got so angry because I was like, fuck you guys, fuck you guys, fuck you guys right in the face. Like we've had this for months and none of you noticed, 
none of you notice, but the moment it happens to somewhere important, so then suddenly like, oh, look at that, like a forest fire smoke is real. But like, it's, and it felt like we don't count. Like our pain didn't count. And it's that sort of like shitty, that thing that like a lot of rural America feels of just like, you know, with, you know, the media basically looks at New York and Los Angeles and that's America. And then everything else is just like flyover states. And, and I was really upset. And as I started talking that out, uh, one of the things I sort of settled on was that like, I'd never really read a book about Ashland where I grew up or my, uh, or seen a movie set there or anything like that. And it's like, when you say, tell people you live in Oregon, they're like, Oh, Portland. And I'm like, Nope. Other, literally other side of the state. And they're like, what? Like they don't know another side of the state. And if you tell them you live there, they're kind of like, Oh, it's so like a logger then. You know, not a logger. Um, and so I just felt like we lived in this blank spot on the map. And as we were talking about this, I realized, Oh, well, of course, no wonder, you know, the, 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 the news isn't covering this there because like for them, it's like a blank spot on the map. They have no frame of reference. They have no context. And so I, in the course of this conversation decided that I really felt like I needed to write something, write a story that was sort of set in the summer of smoke, uh, that was kind of trying to write like the great, like Southern Oregon novel, uh, that kind of took place in this like time of bizarreness so that people knew what it was like to sort of feel like the world was ending, which now doesn't feel like such a revolutionary concept, you know, <laughs> but like at the time it was like every day you feel like the world is ending and yet you just kind of like go about your business. Um, and that seemed very strange and to, to do it in a way that would really sort of like potentially create some sort of like cultural anchor or reference point so that we wouldn't be such a, you know, like a, an empty spot on the map. And uh, so I wrote this story that's about um, this novel that's about a, a family. It's just a, and, you know, each one of them is basically dealing with the smoke in their own sort of way. It's like each, it's driving each of them a different kind of crazy. Right. You know, like uh, one well, of them that, that is sounds based, pretty and universal. Actually, it's not, even though it's yeah. set in this organ and yeah, everyone will be able and to. And I actually based it off the, um, all the characters, like each one of them represents one of the, like the stages of grief. Oh, interesting. So there's like there's the there's the denial character, there's the uh, bargaining character, there's the anger character, the and then there's the uh, acceptance character. Uh, accept the bag, I'm trying to remember them all. There's the acceptance character. Anyway, the point is, yeah, one yeah. of them, each one of them represents one of the stages of grief, and so then they kind of like play that out. Um, you know, like the um, the 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 sort of like father of the family he's um he's basically like in this depressive state where he just won't get out of bed and then uh you know like just obsessively like checks the computer every day because uh the uh younger daughter she's basically turned into like a like an eco radical and she's like you know going around town like spray painting like you know uh you know like earth first graffiti and like you know trying to like do direct action um the uh the, her the mother character is a uh, She's uh, doing the sort of like, well, let's just volunteer at the homeless shelter. That'll help, you know, like kind of trying to do white lady stuff to get out of it. And then the, uh, the teenage son is basically just trying to escape it. So he takes this job uh, helping a guy who's trying to find Bigfoot uh, because the job uh, is like up in the hills. So he can go wander around in the hills up above the smoke and kind of look back in on it. And like all of their sort of stories like intersect and, get real messy um i'm really excited about it it's my favorite thing i've ever written um it's like i think it's yeah it's my it'd be my fifth book and it's my favorite thing i've ever written you yeah. know that's just sound i'm excited to read it um with, with music there's a thing where you can you can self-release things you don't need a label and it can still be successful is it the same way in the literary world are you self-publishing or is this going through some kind of publisher so that's a really interesting because like a lot of the same um, resources that are available for self-releasing your albums are available for self-publishing books. Um, actually, like one of the biggest uh, music distributors, CD Baby, mm -hmm. has a whole separate arm called Book Baby that, oh. where you can like self-press your own books. And so a lot of the same tools are there, and you can do a lot of the same stuff. But what's so fascinating about it is really the cultural uh, 
like sort of like lens on it because like if you tell people i'm in an independent band they say cool way to not sell out you tell people i'm a self-published author they go oh <laughs> oh boy yeah no one you know? wanted you you yeah yeah no one wanted you you're like you're insane like you probably didn't even spell check your manuscript and some and a lot of you know a lot of times that's true but guess what a lot of self-published self-pressed albums are dog shit as well you know (laughs) and it's just that uh it's it's viewed very differently and i think that personally i think that's a bit of like elitism a bit of snobism um because it's like you know the publishing industry is basically consolidated into a handful of mega companies and you know the same way that a lot of media is and if you don't fit the sort of narrow thing that they want then you're off on your own and you know they call uh they, either they call self-pressing they call it vanity press oh, right. and every time someone says that to me i'm like you know tell you what man why don't you walk up to like minor threat like ian mckay you know like yeah. discord like and you, you call him a, you call him a vanity press and see how quick you get punched in the nose you know what i mean like like anytime you say, try say, it, try saying that to like an independent metal band and see how well it goes over before you so that you see what a dick you sound like. Um, so, I I mean like I've shot my books around, um, but you know for the most part like I think I'm writing. A, I tend to be interested in topics that are a little bit niche or a little mm-hmm. bit outsider. Like uh, I had a fairly extended conversation with an agent about Summer of Smoke, and what was interesting about it is that. Um, she she ultimately passed because she said she really just she couldn't relate to any of the characters in the book and i was like that's the point the point is that you can't relate to any of these characters in the book because you live in new york and for you southern oregon is this like you know abstract you know yeah, like, it's a lens into a world you're not familiar with you're not supposed to see yourself right exactly and and to me that's kind of the point and like that's also kind of the point of like reading uh, reading books is that you can kind of get outside your own head and see into a world that you wouldn't be able to see into otherwise and so uh to me that seemed like a benefit but for her uh it was more of a just like well i don't know how to sell it then because like you know people want to see themselves reflected in a book and i'm like well no shitty people want to see themselves reflected in a book that's narcissism you know like interesting <laughs> that's vanity people press want, yeah. like yeah, that's a vanity press when it's just like, oh, t- reaffirm everything I already agree with, you know, Sean Hannity, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, th- you know, a lot of, like, I, I had another extended conversation with an agent once in which she, you know, told me, like, oh, look, here's the thing. What people really like is, like, a m- branded mystery series where all the covers are exactly the same. And I'm like, I hate that. I think that's the worst. That's, you know. So like yeah. the, it's the whole like M is for murder and K is for killing and you know J is for jack me off. Like it's just that stuff's terrible, but that stuff sells, and that's you know that's the problem is that like a lot of people in you know the sort of like especially I think in the underground music world were still like oh you do this for the art you know whatever, and they forget that a lot of it's about like major publishers are just like you know major pop artists you know it's a lot of it's packaged you know uh, like prepackaged sort of craftsmanship. It's like, how do you like, just do a thing that automatically sells? Like an article once in Publishers Weekly that really depressed me. And its thesis was just like, the best way to sell a book is to get on, is to be a, a television host. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, the thing is like, what, people, what, what really sells, or what, age, what publishers really want is they don't want a, like a piece of literature that people are gonna read for, you know, 50 years or that's gonna really speak to people. What they want is that when someone's running through the airport to go to their cousin's birthday party and they realize they forgot to get them a gift and they're running by the, the bookstore, mm-hmm. they go, oh, hey, look at that. That's that comedian on TV that I know they like. I'll buy their book and I'll sell that to you. It doesn't matter if they read it or not. They have other media visibility. And I know this all sounds like, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it sounds kind of like I'm making excuses or something, but it's just like, it's really just a way of saying like, no, it, like their industry is not art. Their industry sales. And what sells is not necessarily what's good. And that's true of all art. I mean, like, why does the be- why does like your favorite record like only have like twenty fans? Because what's good is not necessarily what's like dr- works in the market. And so, like, I'm perfectly content, you know, selling my stuff independently. Uh, it's a lot of work, and I definitely don't get like the amount of like market penetration. But you know what? I I reach people who I know will really like it. And each one gets a little bit bigger, and at some point it will either do better or it won't. And you know, I'd rather that. I'd rather, I'd rather 
work with and sell to people who are going to really get what I'm doing than, you know, waste my time on people who don't. So, you know, it's summer smoke. I raised, I raised money to press it via a crowdfunding campaign. And then I uh, just, I mean, like, if you really think about it, all a publishing company is, is a, is a bank account that pays talented professionals to do the work of putting out a book. I did the same thing. I just did it independently. I raised the money and then I hired the best artists, uh, illustrators, graphic designers, and copy editors that I know and cover designers. And then I'm going to just do all the same marketing stuff I would do. And I'm going to do my, I always do my own book tour and I always, you know, sell them hand to hand and, you know, and then you can put it up. It's available for Amazon. If someone wants it, they can just have it printed or, you know, get to ask a store to order for them. So, I mean, yes, to answer, in the short way of answering, a lot of the same stuff is available to pop authors that is available for musicians. Well, it sounds like this book, you'll hopefully get some more people, kind of like the guy after the first Puppeteers for Fear shows, who will come up to you and say, thank you for doing something different. You're given this book being given Ashland an identity outside of, yeah, you're, you're speaking to something different. And that also captures what, yeah, they're dealing with. That's the hope. I mean, the problem, of course, is that like, you know, if I only sell it to people in Ashland, then it's like, it's, you know, it's, they're like, yeah, no, we get it already. But it's, but it's still, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. But, you know, so the key is trying to get beyond yourself. And the value yeah. of having like a publisher or a record label is that it basically sort of like in the same way where it's is that like we talked about, you know, like when, if everyone in the band brings their three friends, it's like, okay, well, if you sell three books and then the publisher sells three books, it's like, great. But you've sold to totally different groups of people and you can reach beyond sort of your personal network because they have their own networks. Yeah. And that's really the value. But there's a lot of other ways to establish that, you know, and, uh, you know, stay flexible, stay open, do because interesting, you know. So, yeah, yeah uh, I want to see what your show and tell is. Oh. This bad boy, I think. Okay, I can't read the text. Right there? I, I, I can see it. It's a, it looks like some kind of fake Grammy. All right, let's see. It, oh, fake Grammy. Oh. <laughs> a, bet, a better Grammy. Yeah. This? The Grammys uh, are fake. This this is real. No, this, this is... Um, yeah, the Grammys are fake. What's this in the episode of The Simpsons where they do the Grammy? And it's like, they have a d- disclaimer. The producers of The Simpsons do not consider the Grammy an award at all. Um, <laughs> no, this is a, uh, a third place award uh, from the World uh, Championships of Debating and university level okay. uh, in 2008. Uh, I was a, the second runner-up in the public speaking category of the uh, World University's Debating Championship in Bangkok. That was from my uh, uh, career as a college debater where I got to compete internationally. Like, I've flown all over the world to do it. It was great. Which oh, circles fantastic. back to why I will yeah. argue with anything. It's super cool because uh, a couple reasons. I mean, like, one... Like, fuck, it's a world championship. Who the fuck? <laughs> who gets to compete at a world championship of anything, yet, let alone, like, who gets to, like, actually. I feel bring so bad I called it a fake actually... Grammy. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Almost um, but world it was, champion. Uh, it, was, it was really funny because at the t- um, not only am I like, that's cool, that's like the best I'll ever do at anything in my life, and uh, have that, but also, like, at the time, the uh, the university was trying to like cut funding for the debate team, and then mm. we came back and, we had to, and I had to give this like presentation to the their budget committee about like why they should keep the debate oh, team. And I was like, and I was like, okay, so I just got third in the world for this, which is the highest this university has ever ranked in literally anything ever in its entire existence. So, and they were like, okay, I guess we'll keep the debate team, and then they did. So yeah, you, you established cool. ethos in your ethos yeah. pathos logos argument. Yeah, 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 and I. I got some other, I've kept a couple, I've kept a handful of the other trophies, but this one's my favorite because it's the most legit. So what, what was the format for this event? Did you, pre- did, did you have so, a position ahead of time you knew to prepare for? Who was your opponent? How, how does it work? How, how are you dictated so the, to be the, yeah, this second. So round excited round. to talk about debate. Um, so, yeah. uh, the, the format of the, the general form, the general format we did was called worlds or British parliamentary style. And the way it works is that there's uh, four teams of two 
And, uh, the, you know, so you have a partner and then you're, there's four teams that go into a round and they're either considered opposition or proposition. So you're either like the first half of the opposition mm-hmm. or the first half of the proposition. And uh, the tournament would announce a topic, they'd say. And it's always framed as this house believes that X. And then, you know, you have to either argue in favor of that or against that. And you get 15 minutes to prepare for that. And then every oh, person geez. gets okay. the format. Well, it's it's actually less complicated than it seems like mostly because of like a lot of the topics are sort of perennial themes or stuff that you've probably been thinking about anyway. Did you can they have study what's called for the it. Economist. Yeah, yeah, or you you know, it's stuff that comes up enough or it's stuff that's like familiar enough that you can like you, you know, basically shoehorn in like sort of basic talking points. And there was what was called the Economist standard, which is that anything that was con- in the game in the magazine The Economist was considered fair game. So if you basically read The Economist, you should be prepared to argue anything, which is, you know, no small task reading the motherfucking economist, but you know, you can also split through it and like, you know, keep an eye on it. But anyway, uh, and then every person gets seven minutes to speak and that's it. That's those are the rules. And the first, or sorry, the first and the last minute are considered protected time in which no one can ask you questions in the middle five minutes of your speech. People can stand up to ask you questions, but you don't have to accept them. Mm. So the point was just to try to, and the point of what I liked about this particular format of debate was that um, it wasn't really necessarily about being right or wrong, because like a lot of times it was modeled after what uh, like it's called British parliamentary because it's actually how they debate in British parliament. It was created at Oxford as a way of training people for, uh, you know, careers in parliament, like in the, you know, they're going like the House of Lords or something like that. Um, so it has this sort of like, format where both sides can actually be right. But at the end of the day, you still kind of have to say, okay, but ultimately I think this is the, it's called weighing arguments. This is the thing that ends up being more important in this particular case. You know, like the classic example is like, how do you debate what's more important, freedom or security? You know, like right now, there's a perfect example. What's more important, freedom to go around coughing in people's face or the security to not fucking die of a disease? You know, and, you know, I would argue for many reasons that in this particular moment, the security is more important than the freedom. But in a lot of other moments, you might end up saying, I think this, the freedom is more important than the security from, you know, like you could be hit at a bus yeah. by a bus anytime you walk outside. The, so, and, but it's but, more important to be able to walk outside than to be free of buses, you know? Right. Both so, those arguments you would approach with maybe a different viewpoint were like, I, I, I'm a comm major, right. so that, that's my lens was like persuasion theory and like ethos, pathos, logos. The, the emotional yeah. appeal of of like this freedom to do what you want could be downplayed by by the logic of well this is how you're hurting things yeah and so you know you had to kind of like come at it with whatever the unique angle was and one of the things that i really liked about it was um when you got assigned to argue in favor of something that you didn't believe in because it forced yeah, yeah. you to find the holes in your own thinking you know so totally. that you could end up then becoming like you know like m- because if you had like since the things that you believe in, you oftentimes take a face value or you presume are self evident, and there rarely are, you know. And so yeah, you find it was the great like, prophecy. Yeah, like the best. Like I'm Jewish, and the best round I ever had was in favor of Holocaust denial. So you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not, I mean, not even really necessarily, like, literally in favor of, like, look, buddy, we should all deny the Holocaust. It was just, like, in favor of, like, why it was important to preserve Holocaust denial as a legitimate form of speech, which is, like, I genuinely don't really agree in, but with, but I had to, you know, find, like, reasons that uh, uh, I didn't, and I had to sort of look for the holes in my own thinking. That's fantastic. And being able to, and being able to do debate, so that was really, really fabulous. Now, yeah, this particular word is for what's called the public speaking category, which is a little different. It's just, like a sort of side event um, in which you do uh, basically they go they they give you a topic and then you just have to like you have like a couple minutes to prepare and then you have to just give us a, a solo speech there's not really as much debate it's really just you giving a speech on the topic of that um and uh for this for the the final round i had to give a i we all had to reach into a bag and pull something out of it and then we had five minutes to prepare to give a speech on that thing and i pulled out a copy of harry potter and the sorcerer's stone and i had to speak <laughs> to 2,000 members of the international debate community who only care about economics and foreign policy oh. about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which was great because I sort of was able to, I, I love those books and I was able to then go, okay, well, 
Dumbledore had this great quote. He said, you know, there comes a time in which we all kind of decide between doing what is right and what is easy. And I think that ultimately that's the core of what it is that we're trying to talk about here in Fantastic. various debate rounds. We are ultimately deciding what is the right course of action versus what would the easy course of action be. And then I sort of like framed it as that as like a sort of like a, a moral guidestone for, uh, you know, sort of like tackling big topics of like foreign policy and economics that they all cared about. And, uh, you're a professional so, bullshitter. You're just like, I, I, I'll try this. Yeah. And sometimes the form of that bullshit is a song, and sometimes it's a puppet show, and sometimes it's a novel. You, you're starting to pick it up, Mitch. It's all yeah. the same thing. It's all professional bullshit. Yeah. No, but I love this. I, I love debate. Um, if, if that's a thing that anyone out there is interested in, I really recommend watching this thing on Amazon called uh, What the Constitution Means to Me. It was a, a Pulitzer-nominated play. Uh, that you can watch on Amazon, and it's uh, this been her one-woman show about uh, being a, a high school debater, and like how she would travel around the country doing uh, debates about what the Constitution means to her, and then how she's sort of like looking back on that. Um, but what was so fun about it is the final, like the sort of climax of this play. She brings out a, another high school debater, and they do like a an actual like debate round on stage, like a sort of lightning round, but they do a debate round on stage about whether or not to abolish the constitution. And it was so fun to see this like big theatrical, this big uh, Broadway audience view debate as just as dramatic and thrilling and entertaining as I always thought it was. Cause to me, it was like, it was, it was basically like a, a stage play. It was like yeah. a good round was like a stage play. You had clear conflicts, you had engaging characters, you had witty banter, you had dialogue, you had crosstalk, you had something, some core question at the heart of it that was driving it forward. It was, it was great. I loved it. I wrote it. Let, let's There's do a story some, in my first book about it, actually. Let, let's do some kind of impromptu lightning round then. Uh, a few more follow-ups on debate oh, things. Yeah. Uh, do you Bring have it. a favorite like logical fallacy, an argument that's just like, that it gets presented and then it falls apart. When you say favorite, do you mean like like one I actually enjoy oh, or, employing or, or like one, one that you enjoy calling out? Yeah, a pet peeve is a better word for it. If so, oh. if someone says something, you're like, "That's ad hominem. Fuck you." Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a straw man fallacy. I mean, Get out of here. Okay, uh, so the uh, the the fallacy that drives me the most nuts uh, with you know, talking to people is when a specific example is applied globally. Uh, mm. You know, like, you know, and you see this a lot within like cultural critique where it's like, you know, there's like a, a like an anecdote is sort of then seen to be like, ah, and this, you know, this one specific thing that relates to this one thing shows why literally everything is way. And it's like, it really does not. It shows that one thing. And it's just, uh, to me, shows like a, an inability to sort of like, compartmentalize or to sort of like focus on like what really is and isn't germane to a particular conversation or a particular conflict. So that's the one that d drives me the most nuts, but it might just be that's because that's the one I see the most, especially you see that a lot, especially within social media. That's like big thing is just, you know, or appeals to uh, passion over, you know, uh, reason. That's, that's a, a really good answer. It, yeah. There's, yeah. Is there one particular, uh, thank you yeah, very much. My, my last lightning round thing, and then we'll start wrapping up. Um, yeah, is there yeah. one form of appeal that you think is most beneficial, like appealing through logic, emotions, or credibility? Like, if I say something I as mean, president, that has more credibility for, for, yeah, whatever. I mean, that's a really tricky one because, like, honestly, like it, like a true, like a truly sound argument should should hit all three of those. To yeah, and I'd love to say that, like, you know there should be an appeal to pure reason. But the truth is that most people don't operate by pure reason. They operate and operating by pure reason ends up basically being like sociopathy. So there has to be some <laughs> right. sort of like middle path between, you know, like the head and the heart. And a lot of that ends up, especially because a lot of people just sort of, uh, when you're trying to convince them of something, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're right, they're going to do whatever they do because the heart wants what the heart wants. So really the, my, the, the perfect appeal is the one that's sort of straight down the middle between the head and the heart that kind of like goes back and forth and says, you know, like it, it was able to like blend in those two things. And what's frustrating about that is that sometimes you have to abandon little bits of reason. And from time to time, you have to be the tiny little bit heartless. And uh, that's a terrible place to be. Unfortunately, that seems to be like, uh, I think, the, the one that's the most effective, the most effective path. 
That makes sense. Uh, well, I want to give the final word to you. If people want to see any of your countless works, where can they go if they want to get in touch other than get a hold of you? Uh, any other final words you want to give? Uh, I mean, like, I try to keep everything up on my website, thejoshgross.org. Um, I, like, I'm on Twitter, but I don't tweet very often, and I'm real... And I don't like accept some Facebook requests from people that I don't actually know. So like, you know, <laughs> people who don't, so, uh, are, yeah, I don't get that. So I mean, like if one really wanted to contact me, probably the best way would probably just be through the website or something like that. I mean, um, you know, like summer smoke's going to be coming out in the spring. Uh, and then I got another book I'm working on after that. that's going to be pretty interesting. Also, it's a sort of, um, uh, re-envisioning of heart of darkness as a rock and roll tour. Got the proof of it right here crazy working on working on the, the copy editing for it right now um and then you know i don't know hope to see you all out in the in the mosh pits again someday i guess yeah <laughs> cool well josh it was so so nice to talk to you today thanks for giving me your time and uh all, all your wisdom and arguments oh wisdom, wisdom is a strong term but you're welcome for the arguments so that's, those are out for in spades cool all right later everyone